So back in the early 1990s, I dated this woman who for a short time I thought was going to be the woman. I wanted to communicate that to her, so after one particularly romantic interlude, I pulled her close, I looked deep into her eyes, and I said, I don't just love you, I would die for you. And she sat back amused and said, well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. <laughs> Which was kind of my epiphany that we weren't really on the same page in the relationship. But I probably shouldn't use the word epiphany because an epiphany is a very rare, special thing. An epiphany is that moment when the brain, and I would argue something more than the brain inside you, takes information and experience and wisdom and knowledge and slams them together in this galvanizing, emotional, inspirational, really spiritual moment that is a huge leap forward for your intuitive knowledge. Eureka, we say, right? And that's different from earned knowledge, which is a fact from a book or something you get from a Bernie Sanders speech or something you pick up from a completely unqualified but reasonably attractive TEDx speaker, right? <laughs> it's also different from experience hand-on knowledge like, oh, that's hot, or that's what my penis does, neat, right? <laughs> I actually wanted to talk about epiphanies of sex today, but the organizers were very unhappy with my audience participation proposal, so... One of the epiphanies that defines the human experience is that realization that all of you have that at some point you are going to die. Long view my ass. hundred years from now, you ain't going to see it. <laughs> you will be deceased. You will kick the bucket. You will take a dirt nap. You will assume room temperature. You will kick the oxygen habit. You will someday be immortality challenged. As far as we know, we're the only living entity that has the mortality epiphany. The lowest amoeba doesn't have it. Your family dog doesn't have it. Hell, two-thirds of the pseudomayoral candidates don't have the insight, but they have an expiration date. I had to rewrite that joke because Mike Bell's in the back row back there. <laughs> Thinking on your feet, boy. That's what you do. Now, this epiphany of mortality is pretty much the definition of a mixed blessing. Because on the one hand, it allows you to prepare and appreciate the foundation of much of our spirituality comes from this realization. The preoccupation and understanding of death has given us some of the most incredibly moving works of art. Shakespeare's Hamlet soliloquy, right? To be or not to be, that is a question whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by so opposing end them, to die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream. <laughs> There's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil it must give us pause. On the other hand, it's also given us the Twilight novels. <laughs> Edward Shimmered. Now, I can stand before you right now and honestly look every one of you in the eye and say, I have not had the death epiphany. Now, intellectually, I understand that my goal of seeing the country's tricentennial, eh, probably not going to happen. But that's not the same thing as having the emotional punch of that connection, which is why I maintain that as I near 50 years old, my Peter Pan complex and my hairline are doing quite well, thanks. Now, because I haven't had this experience, don't expect me to talk about death for 15 minutes and then say, appreciate life because it ends and hug your kids and it's all got to be about love because I have the credibility to do that with you because I've never had that experience. Spoiler alert, don't expect the happy ending. However, I know that I've had experiences in my life that could someday make up the puzzle of the epiphany. It could. When I was the news editor for the Daily Telegram in Adrian, Michigan, I got a phone call from a man who said, five years ago next week, my 10-year-old boy Elliot was killed. At the time, we didn't talk to the media, but we want to remind people about Elliot and how much we loved him. Would the newspaper do a story? Elliot was a 10-year-old boy who, like all, just a good 10-year-old kid, nothing special, but just a good kid, was riding his bicycle two blocks from house to house when a woman ran a stop sign and ran him over and killed him. 
I went and spent the better part of the day with the family and talked about Elliot's life and the impact he had and what he meant to them and reconstructed that day. And as we got toward the end of the conversation, the mom said, the day after Elliot died, I went into his bedroom, took his burial clothes out, closed the bedroom door, and it has not been opened in five years since. Now, I, being the objective, insensitive, this whole journalist, <laughs> said, well, let's do that. Let's open that door. Let's go through that door together. They looked at each other, declined the opportunity. I wrote the story, so it was published. And a couple days after it came out, the dad called back and said, you put this idea in her head, and no cameras and no story, but she wants if you want to walk in that room with her when she does for the first time. As I drove to the house, I had this image of this dusty room with you know, football and had socks on the floor and a Superman comic opened up and the unmade bed, right? This mom stood at that door beside her husband with her hand on that doorknob. I'm sure it was seconds, but it felt like a very long time. Opened the door and we walked in. And I'll be damned if it wasn't dusty and there was a ball on the dresser and there was T-shirts on the floor. I think it was Spider-Man, not Superman. Bed was unmade, just like I'd envisioned it. What I had envisioned was her complete total breakdown reaction to seeing her son's room after five years. She sat on the bed, and she picked up one of the T-shirts and put it up to her face, and she just wailed. And her husband sat down in the bed and put his arm around her and gave me the you-can-go sign, which I did. And that vision of that set of parents, five years later, grieving like that, that's a puzzle piece for me in the death epiphany in the shape of a twisted bicycle. When my own mother, Rachel, died in 1996, now she'd suffered a long time from Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a messy, hellish, sloppy disease. You wouldn't wish it on anybody. And for the last few years of her life, my brother and I took care of her. We bathed her, fed her, toileted her. We took care of her all we could. But it got to a point where her medical care was beyond our reach, and we had to put her in a care home, which is a horrible, terrible decision to make. It's also a relief. I'll be honest, it's kind of a relief to pass that off to somebody after all those years. Um, but good kid, so every few days I go out and see her, spend a couple hours. And all she ever asked for, once a week, was a box of the honey graham, graham crackers with the cinnamon sugar on top. That's all she wanted once a week. Happy to bring that, right? But one week, I went out to see her. I had a date that night, and I'd really been angling on this date for a long time. I was very excited about this date. So I wasn't really paying attention to what she said. I really didn't interact much. I cut the visit short, took off because I had to shower and get ready, and forgot to take in the box of graham crackers. Well, I get home, and my answering machine light is flashing. Now, kids, back in my day, the <laughs> telephone was connected to the wall by a wire that went through the wall, out the house to a pole, to a room where Lily Tomlin sat, plugging in <laughs> phone calls for people, and attached to that box was another box with a cassette tape inside. And people would call, and they would, they would say their message, and a little like leprechaun guy would repeat it on the tape, and then you'd come home and you'd play the message. That's how we got messages back, back in, in my day. And the light was blinking. I hit the message, Michael, you forgot my graham crackers. Can you run them over? I could have. I had time. It wasn't that far. I had a date. I was getting ready. I, I'll do it tomorrow. Do it tomorrow. So on this date, which is a wonderful time with a terrible person, <laughs> which is kind of the attraction at the time. It's hard to explain. And while I was on this date, having a wonderful, terrible time, she had a seizure and fell into a coma from which she never woke up. Died that evening. And my brother and I got to the hospital over on Cherry Street. Got there just as the doctor was coming out to say that Rachel passed. He tried to hand me a little medical baggie with her ring and some effects, and I, I remember actually slapping the doctor's hand away. I, don't, I didn't want it. And they take you in this little dark room, and Rachel's laying there in her hospital gown, IV marks, and squeezed her hand and kissed her forehead and told her goodbye. And my brother and I, and my brother-in-law walked down to the elevators and in silence, ready to go to the parking lot. And as we get out of the elevator, there's a young girl and a doctor standing on the side. And we're being quiet. We're not saying anything. And the doctor says, are you okay now, Rachel? And the little girl looks up and says, I'm good now. I'm good. I don't know if that's supernatural. I don't know if that's paranoia. I don't know what that is. 
but it's a puzzle piece for my death epiphany in the shape of a little medical baggie that I carry with me. It fascinates me how celebrity deaths can be inspiration for people's death epiphany. The JFK one generation, Princess Diana generation, maybe it's Kurt Cobain, maybe it's Robin Williams from last year ago. For me, it was December 9th, 1980, on a school bus. Woho. Remember Woho, W-O-H-O? Older people go, oh, I remember Woho. They played Help, and then Yesterday, and then Imagine, and then Ticket to Ride. I love the Beatles. John Lennon was my guy. So this was cool, and it didn't occur to me why they would do this. And then the DJ, because the kids, they used to have guys that actually would play music on the radio. It, it's a long time ago. <laughs> so much changes. And he said, last night, John Lennon was shot and killed outside of his apartment building in New York. And I love John Lennon. And the guy, the way he wrote and played guitar and sang, it, it, he, he spoke. It was, my, it was me, man. It, it didn't make sense. This man of peace and love could be shot to death and then blood stain outside the Dakota. That's a puzzle piece for me of this as yet unrealized epiphany. I have a couple college friends live in Fort Wayne, glamorous place, Fort Wayne. And every week, once a year, we drive out there and have a guy's day. It's stupid. You'd be bored with the details, but it's fun for us. I had to do it on a Friday one time, but I had to be back here in Toledo by 6 because I used to host a radio show on WSPD called Eye on Your Weekend, which talked about events and things going on. And every show right before Christmas, we had an actor friend come in, and he played Santa Claus. And kids took calls and gave their Christmas list. Now, we would have preferred to have the real Santa Claus in, but iHeartMedia wouldn't pay for the hotel and the transportation. So we couldn't have the real one, kids. But the, the, he was one of Santa's helpers. And it was fantastic. The kids would call and give their Christmas list, and we would interact, sleigh bells, the whole nine yards. On this particular day, December 14th, 2012, all we heard on the radio coming back was about a shooting in Sandy Hook, Newtown, Connecticut. And all the way back, they talked about those 27 people, those 20 little babies that just got mowed down. Context. Three years ago, I had allowed myself to get to about 405 pounds. And three years ago, on this date, I checked myself into the University of Michigan Bariatric Clinic had sleeve surgery, and dropped more than 200 pounds. You can plot. <laughs> That's hard work. And really cool things happen to your life and body when you lose 200 pounds. But some really uncool things happen, too. Things kind of drop, and it's ugh. So they make you a candidate for what's called abdominoplasty, which is a tummy tuck, is all it is. And you go in, and they unzip you from here to here, and they pull you up, and they take everything out, and they stretch it down, and they ratchet it real tight, and you walk out like this for a long time. It's outpatient. You don't even stay the night. Yeah, I was in at 4 o'clock. I was out 5 o'clock that day. And we had this big recliner we bought because for about a month, you can't climb stairs. You can't lift things. You can't do a lot of things you normally do. So you just sit there and think to yourself. And it was fine for the first two days. Third day, I woke up with just a little touch of fever, like a 9,900 degree fever. You're not supposed to have any fever for the first week. So I call the clinic and tell them about this fever, and they say, yeah, it's probably not a big deal, but we'll have a nurse call you back right away. And a nurse did call me back right away. But I'd passed out in the chair, and I was asleep. Four hours later, when I woke up, I was at 104. My wife takes me to the emergency room, and things are a little cloudy for me there, but I was in sepsis. Sepsis is when your body starts shutting down, your kidneys, everything just starts to shut down. My blood pressure dropped to the lowest of the same of life. They asked my wife about the priest, the last rites, bringing the kids in. I missed all this fun, cool storytelling stuff because I was out. I was out. It was like going to sleep. There was no light. There was no harps or music. I just fell asleep. And if I hadn't woken up, it would have been nothing. When I did wake up and I saw the look on my wife's face, that relief and that just absolute joy of that I was back for whatever reason she has, that's a puzzle piece. That had happened just prior to this road trip to Fort Wayne. We get to the WSPD studio, and I'm sitting in my car talking to my co-host, Jeff McGinnis, and just crying, saying, how do we do this show? How do we talk about Santa Claus? There are 20 kids spread apart. This morning, those parents were wrapping Christmas gifts, and today they're picking out burial clothes. How do we do a Santa Claus show? But we decided to not do the Santa Claus show and take that much more happiness out of the night was not a good call. So we did the show. We warned parents about the news breaks. 
And on that TV, as I'm doing that show, and on radio, they ask you to smile while you talk. Watching the carnage, pretending Santa Claus is there. But that wasn't the puzzle piece. A couple months later in April, now I used to work for a publication called Toledo Free Press. Anybody remember? <laughs> also dead. <laughs> and every April, we sponsored the Lucas County Children's Services Wear Blue Day. Because apparently we're at the point in society when you have to tell people not to smack their kids around. You have to do that as an organized campaign now. That's where we are. So every year we'd help people to wear blue and we'd do all this blue stuff. And I had the bright idea of asking the Toledo Yarn Bomber, who goes downtown and wraps blue yarn around all kinds of rusty, ugly things, if she would do the outside of Lucas County Children's Services building for us. Cool idea. She said, I'd love to do that. That's going to take a lot of yarn. Can you help me find the yarn? So we put the call out on Facebook to all the yarn bombers in the world, and we were inundated by packages from Germany and Sweden and L.A. It was everywhere. Tons of blue yarn. And on the last day of submissions, the next to last big envelope I opened was from Newtown, Connecticut. And inside was a note on a postcard that said, no one knows how much important our kids are for our future and what they mean, then we understand that. Thank you for the work you're doing. And she included 20 blue doilies, one for each kid who'd been shot dead that previous December. I'm in my office at the Free Press with this in my hand, staring at this. Will, help me out here. That's my son, Evan, and my daughter, Sean. I was not dishonest when I told you I've never had the death epiphany for me, but standing there on that day, holding this and looking at them, I had their death epiphany. The fact that they someday have to pass. And that is why I will tell you that it is about love. It's not about what you make or what you have or what you do. It's about how you love. It's about how you reach out to people and what you mean inside. And it is precious because it does get taken away. And it doesn't last. And you don't know when it's going away. And my friend Mike Collins will tell you you don't know when it's going away. And my friend Jim Murray will tell you it doesn't know when it's going away. And my friend Kevin Murphy and a dozen others will tell you you don't know when it's going to be taken away. And the epiphany is, I don't just love them. I would die for them. Amen.